Before I go any further, I would like to share a couple of experiences I had in the late 1990s, shortly after I started working here at Parkinson Canada. I started here in April of 1998, and one day as I was driving home from the office, there was a news bulletin that went something like this. News alert! Michael J. Fox has just announced to the world that he has Parkinson's disease. This news shocked the world, as Michael at that time was 37. And he had shared the diagnosis uh, only after he had been diagnosed with Parkinson's for, at that time, seven years. So basically, he had been diagnosed when he was 30 but he had not disclosed his diagnosis to anyone. Michael also shared as part of this news flash that he could reflect back to having some of the symptoms that he currently was experiencing in his 20s. So although there had been some recognition up to that time that there were a few individuals in the world who developed symptoms of Parkinson's under the age of 50, Fox's disclosure changed the way Parkinson's was viewed and thought of by the world in general. And the headlines in the papers the next day read, Parkinson's isn't just for old people anymore. This one single announcement alone blew holes in the myth that only old people get Parkinson's. The second experience I had was the day my phone rang and it was the wife of whose husband at the age of 34 had just been diagnosed with Parkinson's that morning. By the time she reached me in the afternoon, which is around 2 p.m., she shared that he had immediately quit his job, had submitted his resignation at his golf club, and announced to her a few minutes before that she should file for divorce as he could no longer be the husband and father she had signed up for. Basically, this young man at the age of 34 had quit his life in a matter of a few hours. So putting this all into perspective, the average age of onset of Parkinson's is around 60. In the medical literature, young onset Parkinson's often refers to those individuals whose symptoms first appear before the age of 40, with the upper limit being around 50. So basically, individuals who have Parkinson's disease symptoms and are older than 20 and younger than 50 are considered young onset. And these individuals make up approximately 5 to 10% of individuals with Parkinson's throughout the world. Generally, Symptoms in people who have young onset Parkinson's are similar to symptoms in those who have later onset disease. In other words, some challenges in Parkinson's are universal. But, of course, like everything else with Parkinson's, there are certainly some differences. For example, people who have young onset Parkinson's seem to be more likely to have tremor as a prominent early symptom than those with later onset disease. Another difference is that dystonia, or abnormal prolonged muscle spasms associated with Parkinson's, often show up earlier in the course of the disease. Dystonia often involves curling of the toes, with the big toe sometimes pointing straight up, and sometimes the foot turns in at the ankle. This muscle cramping can be very painful, making activities that the rest of us do every day, such as just straightforward walking, very difficult. In those of you who were diagnosed after the age of 60, you may have experienced dystonia too, but not until much later in the course of the illness, and particularly after medication had already been started when the effects of your levodopa wears off, sometimes first thing in the morning. Dystonia in young onset Parkinson's often begins before levodopa is even started, 
And although it is well recognized as the possible first symptom in those under the age of 50, you may have had dystonia for years if the doctor in charge of your treatment was not considering Parkinson's as a possible diagnosis due to his or her lack of understanding about Parkinson's in the younger population. Younger people seem to be more sensitive to the benefits of Parkinson's medications. In other words, the medications tend to work very well and their symptoms of tremor, slowness, and stiffness are improved quite quickly. But the downside of treatment in the younger individuals is that they tend to develop drug-induced dyskinesia and severe motor fluctuations, including ons and offs, i.e. wearing off. And this can happen quite soon after levodopa is begun, whereas in the older population, these on and off symptoms as well as drug-induced dyskinesia doesn't happen until much later on in the course of the disease. Needless to say, this is a real catch-22 that those with later onset Parkinson's don't have to deal with for several years. I mention this because many individuals with young onset Parkinson's that I have spoken to over the years have elected to postpone treatment with anti-Parkinson medications as long as possible in order to avoid some of the escalated symptoms and side effects. It is important to note, however, that research shows no clear evidence that early withholding of therapy, levodopa I'm referring to now, has any long-term benefit and the consequences of delaying treatment too long can be just as or even more disruptive than the early development of drug-related side effects. So let's take a few minutes to really explore the dilemma and treatment concerns when it comes to young-onset Parkinson's. The key issues for people with young-onset Parkinson's to consider are when to start using medication for symptom relief, and what medication to use at the beginning of treatment. As you know, everyone with Parkinson's is unique, and there is no single strategy that appears to help and apply to everyone. The key issues for the physician when their patient with Parkinson's is in their 30s or 40s is how to manage the symptoms to provide the patient with the best quality of life for the longest time. As many of you listening today who are over the age of 60 are retired and have taken anti-Parkinson's meds for years, you may have experienced has joined the conference. undesirable side effects such as dyskinesias. Now put yourself in the position of being 30 or 40 or even just 50 and imagine how much more disruptive those side effects would be if you were still working. So in summation, regarding treatment, medication, and side effects, here are some things you need to consider. Many of the serious side effects of anti-Parkinson medications occur after long-term use. The simplest way to avoid side effects is to reduce the amount of time that an individual is using the medication. So this seems pretty straightforward. As younger people have more life ahead of them and therefore more opportunity to develop the long-term side effects, such as dyskinesia, delaying the side of medications would be the best option. Dan Linton has now, joined the conference. But, 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 but wait, there is a balancing act here because younger people have family and career responsibilities to fulfill. And these responsibilities are harder to fulfill with Parkinson's symptoms in full bloom, i.e., medication would be especially beneficial for them right from the get-go. Finding that right balance is a continuing process worked out between the patient and the doctor. Unfortunately, some people believe that levodopa therapy is toxic or loses its effects after the first five years. So again, 
especially those with young onset Parkinson's, delay treatment with the result that they experience unnecessary disability. As I said a few minutes ago, delaying treatment too long for any reason can be more disruptive than drug-related side effects. A balanced approach to initiating treatment is key, not necessarily starting at the very earliest stages when your symptoms cause no impact whatsoever or function on your quality of life, but not delaying beyond a time when symptoms are having this impact. So aside from the fact that you probably had difficulty getting an accurate diagnosis right from the beginning, because after all, you're too young to have Parkinson's, and all the questions about your symptoms, the side effects of medications and decisions as to, to treat or not to treat, the most difficult challenge may be the fact that you're young. You had planned a life packed with many goals, and one of them was not living with a chronic and progressive condition. Most people in their young adult years tend to see themselves as invincible. They may take steps to ensure financial security for their family and themselves, and the unlikely event that something bad happens, but they really don't consider that to be a real possibility. But now, the unlikely event has happened. You've been diagnosed with young onset Parkinson's, and it's standing directly in the way of the life you had planned. In some of my recent chats, I've talked about the ride on the emotional roller coaster after you hear the doctor say, you have Parkinson's. Regardless of what age you are, when you hear those words, your initial reaction may range from disbelief to denial to anger and to all of the above and then some. But those of you who are in your 20s, 30s, and 40s, your mind may rocket from one image to another, and your head may feel like it's going to explode with questions like, will I see my kids grow up, graduate, and get married? Will I be able to work, support my family, pay for the kids' university education, what about the dreams I had of traveling, starting my own business? How quickly will I progress? I think it's important to give yourself some time to mourn the fact that your life does not for the moment seem to be headed in the direction you had hoped. The grieving process will be different for everyone, and you will all go through the stages of disbelief, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and eventually you will get to acceptance. One thing that may be helpful at this time is to stop for a moment and consider other times when you faced what seemed like an impossible challenge and reflect on how you responded to that challenge. Maybe it was the loss of someone who was very important to you, Maybe you didn't get the job you were hoping for. Or maybe you ran into unexpected financial difficulties and felt very overwhelmed and not sure which way to turn at that moment. Whatever the challenge, you took some mental steps to face the threat or achieve what you wanted to. Adjusting to a diagnosis of Parkinson's is always difficult and adjusting to the idea of a chronic illness that will live with you for many years, plus the added responsibility of a young family and a career on top of everything else, is daunting, to say the least. If you are a newly diagnosed young onset person with Parkinson's, I know it may not seem possible right now, but I believe you will get through this and come out on top again. The shock, fear, and confusion will be replaced with the realization that it is possible to live well with Parkinson's. And in order to do that, 
I will quote a young onset individual has been, who has been living with Parkinson's for 17 years that it has been my privilege to hear speak on several occasions. She states, at some point, you have to abandon your fear of the future in order to begin living your present. Another young onset Parkinson's person that I know said, everyone has to deal with challenges and tough choices at some point in life. Mine came sooner than I expected, but once I expected that Parkinson's was mine and said, this is the life I've been given to do with as I choose, it's up to me to figure out how I'm going to manage it. The individuals I've just quoted have both had Parkinson's for many years, and I realize some of you listening today may be more newly diagnosed and feeling that you've totally lost control of your life. But you can only lose control if you surrender to it, if you choose to hand it over to someone else and follow other people's orders. There's a much better approach to Parkinson's for both yourself your spouse or partner, significant other. This approach gives you the best chance of living the life you planned before diagnosis. Take charge of this thing. Empower yourself. Become an advocate in your own health. Be proactive, not reactive. Do what matters most now and not someday. I remember reading the title of Michael J. Fox's book, Lucky Man, and thinking to myself, who is he trying to kid? But after reading the book, I realized there are some advantages to adopting a positive and optimistic outlook. Here are a few things I've learned from Michael and other young onset individuals. The very fact that time becomes more precious can instill the determination not to waste an hour or a day. Close relationships can be strengthened. Marriages, parent-child connections, both yours as a parent and yours as the child of aging parents. Genuine and dedicated friends will stick with you. Hangers-on will not. And you may be surprised at who's who in that bunch. New people, interesting and stimulating, understanding and fun, come into your life, if you let them, that is. There's nothing like a progressive illness to make you get off your butt, take that trip, write that novel, or even go back to school. You have the opportunity now to work with other people to make real differences in the lives of millions. How many people do you know that can say that? You may not have chosen this fresh start, but suddenly you understand that life is finite. And that's a good thing. By sharing some of these thoughts, I don't mean to make light of anyone's situation and pretend that everything is a bed of roses. But while things may be weighing heavily on you right now, it is very important to keep things in perspective and remember that there are advantages as well as disadvantages when one is trying to adjust to a chronic illness. So what about your relationships with your family? And here, I'm including your partner or spouse, your children and teenagers, and your parents. Parkinson's really is a family affair, and this is particularly true with young onset Parkinson's. Everyone in the family will have issues that need to be addressed. Take your spouse or partner, for example. Depending on your situation, a spouse may suddenly find themselves as co-breadwinner and eventually may need to assume some of the tasks and roles in the family that the person with Parkinson's previously managed. It is very important for couples to keep an honest, and open dialogue about their feelings, both the person with Parkinson's as well as the care partner. This needs to be an ongoing negotiation 
and requires constant dialogue, particularly when it comes to when to offer assistance, when to ask for assistance, and when to hold back. Experience has taught me that couples who manage best in the face of dealing with a chronic illness begin talking together on day one and never stop. Discussing how the disease is affecting da daily operations in the families and developing strategies around what can be done to make things easier for everyone is tantamount to dealing with Parkinson's. Those care partners who learn to be flexible, state their own changing needs clearly, and protect regular blocks of private time to meet those needs over the years, are those who will be successful care partners and will be able to go the distance without allowing Parkinson's to define them and rob them of their life. This is not a selfish act. It is crucial to the well-being of the person with Parkinson's and to the whole family. Care partners must do whatever it takes to maintain his or her own physical, mental, and emotional health. Young families have to deal with the unique issues of communicating the diagnosis and sharing the daily ups and downs of Parkinson's with children of all ages. If your children are very young, just keep the news simple. Encourage them to ask questions and make your answers short and to the point. Matter-of-fact answers on a need-to-know basis can be very reassuring to children. Just don't try to hide it from them. Children are very bright and very perceptive. They'll see the changes. Talk about them, but in a very simple, reassuring way. Communicating with your teenagers may be more challenging. Let's face it, communicating with teenagers with or without Parkinson's can be challenging. Because at this age, kids are dealing with a lot already. They're trying to find their own identity among their peers, as well as within the family. They're trying to live up to adult expectations and the ever-escalating pressure to make the right choices. Now you come along and deliver the news that you have Parkinson's, something they have may, may have heard about but may have had some misinformation about as well. Depending on their age and your relationship, they may or may not ask any questions, but don't assume they don't have any. Today's teens are very proficient with social media and their computer skills are excellent. So maybe asking them to research a specific PD topic or to bookmark a good PD website for the whole family might take away some of their fears and concerns that can arise from them feeling left out of key discussions. If your parents are older, they will probably be shocked to learn that their child has been diagnosed with a disease that is usually associated with people their age. Their concern will be amplified even more if they are emotionally or financially dependent on you for support. When it comes to your friends, they can only be there for you if you let them. Friends can listen when you don't want to burden your care partner. They can take the focus off PD and get you back on track of living the life that you had planned including possibly even doing some pushing and shoving of you and irritating you until you'll do anything to get them off your case, especially if you're having a pity party. After disclosing, you will be able to share information, and this will help those around you not only understand Parkinson's in general, but the implications that it can have on things that you can do, as well as the things that are more difficult for you now to lessen the amount of embarrassment and awkwardness between you. The last thing you want with any of your relationships, whether with your spouse, your children, your parents, or your friends, is to make Parkinson's the focal point of what your relationship 
on, in the, on, excuse me, of your relationship on the whole. And it, you don't want it to be all about you either. So open and honest dialogue is one way to prevent this from happening. Regardless of your age, there are a couple of things that I've learned about disclosure from people with Parkinson's. First of all, don't tell everyone all at once, as everyone will have questions and you will feel overwhelmed trying to deal with everyone at the same time. Secondly, don't tell anybody until you are comfortable with yourself. You need to adjust to the news before you share it with anybody so that you can present it in such a way that they realize Parkinson's is life-altering, not life-threatening, and definitely not a life sentence. You have a lot of life to live yet. So now at Robert's turn, he will be discussing employment issues such as disability discrimination, job modifications, financial planning, and in some cases, support program. Thank you for listening to my section, and here's Robert. When it comes to considering both family and disclosure issues, one of the areas that people call us about is employment. While we're not employment counselors, there are several issues that may be unique to people living with PD we're still working, and today's society, that includes people working well into what was formerly thought of as senior years. Age is a number, and many people, regardless of a diagnosis of PD or not, choose to continue to work for as long as they possibly can. The first consideration is that we want to be able to maximize a person's working life in order to ensure that they're in a more financially secure position. This may mean me this may mean that some people need to start medications earlier than someone who may be retired, as they need to minimize slowness, stiffness, and tremor as much as possible in order to perform the essential duties of their job. It will be very important for you to share with your doctor how your particular symptoms are impacting your ability to work. Your specialist may be looking at you in a general sense of how much change there's been since your last appointment and may not be thinking about your symptoms in comparison to others and how it might be actually causing you issues in the workplace. A common example I give to people to consider is that someone who has a light tremor and works in an office environment may choose to delay treatment, as that's just an annoyance but not disabling. An electrician with a light tremor would probably begin treatment much, much sooner, as it could be a matter of life and death. And while you may be getting through your shift from a nine to five, what does your evening and weekend look like? Are you so exhausted that you do not have time to eat properly, socialize, help your spouse, or interact with your kids? Your doctor needs a clear snapshot of your life, and it's up to you to communicate this. If you've never seen our patient summary or gotten a copy of our tip sheet on how to talk to a neurologist or other doctor for that matter, these may be helpful. They can help you to track your symptoms and prepare and for your next the conference. visit. Chances are it will be short, so you need to make the most of that time. You'll also want to have an open dialogue about your symptoms and your work life with your doctor, as there could be potential impact in terms of discrimination, which I'll discuss in a minute. The bottom line is, if your doctor doesn't know it's broke, they can't fix it. Now let's take PD out of the situation for a moment. A 2016 survey by the Canadian Payroll Association discovered that 48% of Canadians are living paycheck to paycheck. Four in 10 did not think that they could put together $2,000 for an emergency. Nine in 10 Canadians are carrying some form of debt, and a third of those are feeling overwhelmed by it. This means regardless of a diagnosis of PD or not, most Canadians need to be doing some financial planning or re-examining their spending habits. The diagnosis of PD can be a wake-up call for people to be doing what they should have been doing prior to their diagnosis. It's just that there's more urgency now as that vague, what if something happens that lurks in most people's mind has now happened. I'm putting it in this perspective not to depress you, but impress upon you that you are not alone in worrying about financial matters. You may have to crunch some numbers in order to properly budget. You may need to speak to a financial planner in order to get some external perspective and make informed choices. 
You may need to sit down with your spouse in terms of making a personal plan for your family, which could include an eventual trade and roles, in some cases, of who's the main breadwinner and who takes on more work of the work at home. You may find yourself opting to take a course in order to switch fields. There's no one-size-fits-all solution, so it will be up to you to consider your options. Many people incorrectly assume that Parkinson Canada provides income support to people. We can't. Consider your salary and multiply that by 100,000 Canadians living with Parkinson's, and that's how much we'd have to raise to meet that need. Add in costs for equipment, home modifications, and other expenses, and that can potentially go along with, that can potentially go along with having a progressive condition, and you'll understand why we are limited in doing what we can with what we have in order to make the most effective impact in the lives of the largest number of people. With all the talk from south of the border about insurance and health care, it's vitally important that people consider what programs we do have in this country. Again, it's up to you to do your homework. Sadly, we do get calls from people who have quit their jobs before talking to their doctors and before investigating what their options were. And this can jeopardize the options that were open to them. Canadians diagnosed with Parkinson's fall into the legal description of having a disability, but that does not automatically mean that they're considered unable to work. For example, someone who's missing a leg is also considered to be disabled, but can use an artificial leg and still continue to work. Likewise, a person living with Parkinson's needs to explore all their treatment options with their doctor before they may be eligible for any form of private or public disability income support program. If you have private insurance, either personal or through your workplace, it will be important to have a clear understanding of what the limits of that package are and what they consider to be a disability or not. If you have a human resources department or a union, you may be able to discreetly get additional information if you're feeling worried about asking your insurance company directly. You must meet certain standards before being able to access short-term or long-term disability. All insurance packages vary, so you must read yours. We have a fact sheet online about disability insurance through workplace programs, which may give you insight on planning further ahead. Most Canadians may be able to access certain federal income support programs or a program specific to their own province. Federally, there are short-term sickness benefits through employment insurance, which may last up to about 15 weeks. Long-term, there is the Canada Pension Plan Disability Benefits Program. It's imperative that you apply for both of these at the same time because it can take up to four months to have CPP disability benefits approved, so you want to ensure that you're covered during the interim with EI sickness benefits. Now, the following comes right from Service Canada. To qualify for a Canada Pension Plan disability benefit, you must have a severe and prolonged disability, be under the age of 65, and meet the CPP contribution requirements of having contributed in the last four, in the last four of the last six years or three of the last six years if you contributed for at least 25 years. There are a few other exceptions to these rules. Having a severe disability means that you have a mental or physical disability that regularly stops you from doing any type of sustainable, gainful work. Prolonged means that your disability is long-term and of indefinite duration. Both the severe and prolonged criteria must be met at the same time at the time of application. Now that's a mouthful, but it's important to understand. PD will qualify as a prolonged condition because it's a chronic ongoing condition, but it's not severe in all cases. And for those of you who may be an older, young onset person, you need to be aware at the age of 65, your CPP disability converts to regular CPP payments, which may be a lesser amount. Your CPP disability payment is based on your CPP contribution history plus a fixed amount. The average monthly payment in 2016 was $934.37. There is a maximum CPP disability payment, and in 2016, the maximum monthly anyone could get as an individual was $1,290.81, and that maximum amount increases a bit each year. In addition to CPP disability amount, you may get additional payment for each dependent child. 
and in 2016, the monthly amount per dependent child was $237.69. Again, these uh, payments can increase a bit each year. Now, provincial programs differ in terms of both the amounts received as well as the rules in accessing it. They are all considered to be programs of last resort. Common features are that you are a citizen or a permanent resident of Canada, that you're living in the province you're applying for funding from, are considered disabled enough not only to find employment in your own field, but other jobs, and have a minimal amount of assets. If you qualify for full CPP disability payments, you will not get additional amounts from the province. But if you only get a partial amount from CPP, you may get an increase to the level that the province pays. Each province has additional benefits, which could include drug coverage, which are separate from the income support programs. So it's always worthwhile in checking out to see whether you qualify or not. Has joined the conference. These amounts may come as a shock to a lot of people. Most people are aware that we have a social safety net, but many people are unaware of how limited it may be. There's a lot of paperwork involved, which is intrusive in looking at both your health status, your symptoms, and in the case of provincial programs, looking into your finances. This is part of the checks and balances that the public wants in order to ensure that tax monies are not being misused by fraudulent claims. You need to be very detailed with the paperwork, especially in terms of explaining subjective symptoms such as anxiety or fatigue and how these symptoms impact your quality of life. This has to be verified by your doctor, which goes back to what I said about having an open conversation with your doctor so that there's a record of what's going on. The paperwork is looked at by bureaucrats, so all your I's need to be dotted and your T's crossed before anything can get processed. If your claim is denied, there will be a specific reason given as to why, and that is the point you can appeal to. Quite often, it's a lack of information on the first application that doesn't illustrate the impact of your symptoms on being able to work. It's stressful, but it can be done. And it's stressful because people are suddenly looking at you on paper, not understanding who you are or what you're going through at that moment. There isn't a spot about your dreams or what your future had planned out to be. People are looking at the diagnosis and not at the person. And that's the point where discrimination comes in. It's easy to make judgments about others when you don't know them or have preconceived notions. Some people are shocked, for example, that they're suddenly lumped in with people on welfare because this isn't their fault and those so-called welfare queens are out to scam the system, aren't they? That system that you now know is challenging and detailed to access. People may see you as the victim or sufferer of Parkinson's, but you know that while you may have some challenges, that you're actually doing just fine, thank you very much. People don't want to be judged by their symptoms or their diagnosis. They are people living with Parkinson's and still in control of their lives when Parkinson's isn't living with them. Where discrimination can really be an issue for some is in the workplace. Again, having a diagnosis of PD does put you in the category of having a disability and there are employment standards in every province about discriminating against those with a disability. But you do need to take charge. You do not necessarily need to disclose your diagnosis, but may need to have your doctor put something in writing saying that you are being seen and if there are any modifications needed for your job in order to accommodate you. Employers can be fearful of accommodation, thinking about how much is this going to cost them. And that's where you need to be clear and that your doctor and you are both on the same page as to what you can and cannot do. You're going to have to figure out for yourself what can be reasonably accommodated, and it's usually not all that expensive for an employer. You might just need a workstation that's closer to a bathroom. You might just need the option to work from home periodically, or possibly getting some changes in your shifts for appointments. Now you do have to be realistic and that some jobs simply cannot be accommodated. For example, you couldn't be a quadriplegic and expect to become a firefighter because the job requires that somebody be physically able to do the work. What is important is that as well as you think you're hiding your symptoms, PD can be obvious. A tremor can be hard to hide. 
You may be dragging a foot unknowingly. You may appear to be exhausted. Or you might have a lack of facial expression that may seem like you're not interested. And yes, people can talk. And employers may think that either you have an even more significant issue like drug misuse or that you're not pulling your weight and make it a performance problem. If you have not been proactive in disclosing that you have a chronic condition, you may find that you're terminated for another reason. Surprisingly to most people is that your employer can actually become one of the best supporters once you disclose what's going on. Quite often, it's the act of hiding symptoms that stresses people out, which is actually making their symptoms even more visible. Reducing the stress by disclosing can give you more energy to focus on your actual work and be as productive as you once were before. In those rarer instances where an employer is, is more difficult, make sure that you are documenting everything, including any discussion that relates to your diagnosis. BCC yourself on emails if needs be and store the information for later. Save copies of all your performance appraisals or other annual measures to demonstrate how everything was prior to your diagnosis. Consult with your provincial body that deals with human rights or labor laws to get some feedback on your particular situation so you know what your rights are. Sometimes you may need a lawyer, but usually this is in very, very particular situations. Employers want to avoid legal proceedings as much as you do, so by being proactive, you reduce a negative outcome. It's easy to become discouraged and frightened when you do not know what steps to take. Reducing your stress by doing a little investigating on what is most applicable to you is going to help you in the long run. And if you're not sure where to start, then by all means, give us a call, and one of our information and referral associates will be happy to help make some connections where we can. So overall, it's a different journey for everybody with Parkinson's. And again, being a person living with young onset Parkinson's, um, just like anybody with Parkinson's, there's no one size fits all, and it's a little bit different for everybody. So that's all that Sandy and I have to chat about today. So we're going to let you go for now. But if you do have questions, by all means, feel free to call us or email us. And our next particular talk will be in October. Um, but next month there will also be a, a presentation given as well um, on PD and driving by Beth Robertson, who's an occupational therapist from McGill University Health Center on September 12th. So we look forward to connecting with you again. Otherwise, take care. Be well. Bye for now. The leader has turned lecture off and your lines have been unmuted.